Okay, yeah, so like I said, John 14, and uh, I think we're starting at the um, eighth verse. You ended last week with Gary verse uh, six and seven, kind of a huge classic uh, statement um, in the Gospel of John. We're in the Upper Room Discourse, and Jesus kind of says one of his I am sayings, right? His I am statements. This is the sixth one. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You remember that from the end of last week. Um, no one comes to the Father except through me. And if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So Gary ended kind of just briefly mentioning the kind of, that that's a Trinitarian statement, isn't it? Is that hinting at the equality uh, between the, the Father and the Son, the only begotten eternal Son. And if you remember, uh, Gary gave you a challenge to go and look up the Nicene Creed uh, and read it. I wonder if anyone did that. Um, if you didn't, I've got it here. So this is the kind of the, the beginning of the creed is what I think Gary wanted you to take a look at, uh, which says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father, before all worlds. And this is the key bit, I think. God of God, light of light. Very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. And I think it's that one substance is absolutely crucial, and it will be important as we go through today's lesson. The Son and the Father, they're one substance, they're one essence. They are co-equal uh, in power and glory and eternity. Morning. So let's keep that in mind as we go through uh, today's lesson. We're going to be starting in verse 8. Hopefully we'll finish the chapter. I'll try and do it fairly quickly. We'll have to skate over a lot of stuff because this is meaty stuff. It's deep stuff. There's a lot in there. So uh, be thinking of questions uh, for the end. John 14, chap uh, yeah, John chapter 14, verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, we'll pause there for a little bit. So, Philip <laughs> asked a kind of classic disciple Question in the in the upper room discourse, there's a few times when a disciple asks a question of Jesus, and it kind of is a, a device employed by John so that Jesus can then elaborate on what he's saying, kind of explain a little bit more um, about what he wants to reveal to the disciples. But it's a it's a it's a classic disciple question, in as much as it has some good motives, but it's also a little bit confused. Jesus has just said to his disciples, "If you know me." then you would have known my father also. And he says that from now on you do know him and you have seen him. That's what Jesus has just said. Um, but Paul, um, Philip is kind of like, okay, could you just clarify that a little bit more? Because we do want to see the father. He wants a little bit more uh, of an obvious, uh, less kind of, if you like, enigmatic statement from Jesus, um, which is, in some sense, is a good motivation because, as uh, D.A. Carson, one um, commentator, says, to see the Father is a good motivation. If you, you want to see the Father, right? This is the kind of the high point of the Old Testament revelation is when God show, reveals something of his nature and character to Moses, and Moses just gets to see, you know, the back of God, if you like, when he passes by and declares his name to Moses. This is a good thing that Philip wants. Uh, but it's a little bit confused because Jesus is literally just telling him, you have seen the Father. But he's like, yeah, but what if you just showed him 
us a little bit clearer. But I think that is, in some senses, um, maybe a question that we can relate to. Because if you think, probably kind of more towards the early stages of a Christian's life or in the process of conversion, you can read the Gospels. And if you're honest, you can think, okay, this, this, I've seen this, this Jesus, but is that enough to like convince you of the reality of who he claims to be and who God is? Or are you ever tempted to think to yourself, maybe if Jesus could just make it a little bit clearer, be a little bit, maybe if he could just answer one of my prayers a little bit more uh, concretely, perhaps if he could just do a little bit of a miracle in my life, maybe I could have a clearer sense that this is true. Uh, and a clearer sense that, yes, this, uh, what he says about himself is, is true. But that's not what Jesus, um, or that's, that's not, that is the confusing, confused bit of uh, Philip's question, if you like. Jesus had just told Philip that if you'd seen him, you've seen the Father. So the implications for us are kind of huge. Um, it's a very plain statement. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. We don't need anything more than Jesus in order to believe have a full and rounded faith, um, and, it, and we have the full revelation of God here or in Jesus Christ. The Son and the Father are one. The Father dwells in the Son. They're co-equal. They're co-eternal in power and glory and might, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. So if you've seen one, you've seen the other. And that has implications for us kind of doctrinally, as we think about what we confess as a church, if Jesus was less than the Father, then he couldn't reveal God, could he? Um, so it's very important that we confess Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, equal to the Father, because if he was created in any way or if he was less than the Father, then when he says, you've seen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he would be, that would be a mistruth because the Father would be different enough that he couldn't fully <coughs> reveal him. But it has implications for our Christian life as well. Because as we look at the New Testament, we can be fully assured that as we encounter the person of Christ in the, in the scriptures, this is God. If we want to know what God's like, if we have any questions about the character and nature of God, we want to see him for ourselves, then we can look to Jesus in the scriptures. And we learn about what God's like in his love uh, for the world, his willingness to come and die for his people, his commitment to the lost, his kindness and compassion on people, his willingness, yeah, his willingness to humble himself, his service of others, his faithfulness, his patience, his mercy, his forgiveness. They're all displayed in Jesus' life and ministry, aren't they? So when we look at Jesus, that's the heart of God, if you like. That's who God is. We don't need any more revelation of, oh, what's God really like? Could we just see the Father a bit more clearly? No, we've seen him in the life and ministry, the work, the death and resurrection of Jesus. But then uh, Jesus goes on to say some things that could be a little bit confusing in verse 12 and 11 or could be taken uh, 12 and 13 and 14 in various ways. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. What does that mean? Does it mean that the followers of Jesus, the disciples, will do better works than Jesus? Will they do more works? Will their works be more impressive than Jesus? What does he mean when he says, you'll do greater works? Well, I think uh, in this verse, the important bit is that he says, because I am going to the Father. You'll do greater works because I am going to the Father. You see, Jesus, when he departs after his, uh, after his death and his resurrection, he ascends, he departs to the Father. That's an enthronement, right? He goes up to heaven and he is enthroned on the right hand of God the Father and all things are uh, gradually being placed under his feet. His enemies are being made his footstool and things like that. It's an inauguration, if you like, of the new covenant dispensation in which we live uh, as New Testament church believers, right? We live in the new covenant. So before Jesus went to the Father, all his works, were they were slightly veiled, weren't they? People didn't understand them. They didn't understand his parables. They didn't fully comprehend who he was 
or the works that he was doing. They had, if you like, a veil over them. But now he's gone to the Father, his works are understood for the greatness that they are and their revelatory power. So the disciples, when they go out and they do their miracles and they preach the gospel and their works of power accompany their ministry, um, they're teaching more clearly about the nature of Jesus and the fullness of the gospel is now understood because Jesus has died and risen again. Uh, Herman Ridderbos, I think, kind of sums it up well, saying greater does not mean that their works will surpass those of Jesus, but that the works that Jesus has done on earth are merely the beginnings and the signs of the all-encompassing power and glory with which he, as the heavenly Lord, will be clothed, and in the exercise of which the disciples will be involved in this dispensation of redemptive history. i read that again. Greater does not mean that their works will surpass those of Jesus, but that the works that Jesus has done on earth are merely the beginnings and signs of the all-encompassing power and glory with which he as the heavenly Lord will be clothed and in the exercise of which the disciples will be involved in this dispensation of redemptive history. Which I think that sums up that verse very well. But then he goes on to, Jesus goes on to say another thing that could be misconstrued. He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, basically. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And obviously, the plain reading of that, you could come away thinking, okay, if we use Jesus' name in a prayer, then he's obligated to do what we ask, right? It's like a magic spell or an incantation or something. Use Jesus' name, get a result. But that's not really what this verse is, um, is teaching, and I don't think anyone would really think that if they'd been around the church for five minutes. Uh, and the key bit is that he says uh, in verse 13, you ask in my name that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Okay. So it's not a carte blanche, kind of anything goes, Jesus' name will get you uh, whatever you pray for, but it's only that which accords with Jesus' name. Okay. It's only those things that bring glory to the Father through uh, the Son. So if we pray for things that bring glory to the Father through the Son, those are prayers that are going to be answered positively. That's what Jesus is promising to do for us, glorify the Father through the Son. He's going to complete his mission, um, his, his ascended mission, his resurrected mission, as the kingdom goes forth, and we're praying for salvation in Jesus' name, for his name to be glorified, for the Father to be lifted up. Those sorts of prayers are going to be answered. So those should be the goals of our prayer, basically. It teaches us about our prayer life. What should our prayer life be like? It should be about glorifying the Father through the Son. Now let's keep moving so we can actually uh, get through what we've got this morning. Uh, let's pick up in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he, dwe he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. I'm going to stop there for a second. So, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's a good verse to remember. It's a, very, a nice, straightforward, easy verse to understand. Commandments come from Jesus' character, right? They're not just completely arbitrary. They're an extension of 
who Jesus is, the things that he commands. They're a revelation of God's will for us. They're the best way to live. You could say they were good gifts from God. So how could we claim to love Jesus if we don't you know, care for his commandments and want to keep them, if we don't obey him? That wouldn't make any sense, would it? So the love becomes uh, an att- the test of our, or our obedience, rather, come, becomes the test of our love for Jesus. If we don't keep his apartment, uh, apartment commandments, uh, in some sense we're kind of denying his goodness, aren't we? His kingship and his power um, and his right over our life, his right to rule over our life. And he goes on to say, and I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper to be with you. So here we get into the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and this is going to be very important over the next few weeks. So I won't say everything about the Holy Spirit today, um, but uh, we are given a kind of key insight, if you like, into the life of the Trinity here. Uh, Jesus is acting in his mediato- med- mediatorial role uh, for us because he's going to the Father to ask for the Holy Spirit on our behalf. And he's going to send this uh, paraclete, you probably know the Greek word, you've heard that probably before, the word that's used here, a helper, an advocate, a comforter, all those sorts of things. And this helper is going to last forever. And we learn that it's also the spirit, or he is also the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But he says to the disciples that you do know him, this, this comforter he's all, that's coming. You know him, for he dwells in you, and he will be with you. So the Spirit is the Spirit of truth, just as the Father and the Son are completely true, aren't they? Uh, true in their very nature, in their very essence, so is the Spirit, which becomes very important when you think about the Spirit being the inspirer of Scripture, the author of the Word of God. He reveals things, doesn't he? That's kind of one of the roles of the Holy Spirit in his truth ministry, if you like. He reveals the Son. He reveals the Father. He makes things known to believers. He brings things to light through conviction and things like this. But when the Holy Spirit's doing those things, the world cannot receive him because the Holy Spirit is a gift to the believer, right? It's not for everyone. It's just for those in the church, those who are united to Christ. Indeed, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that one um, can even see and know uh, Jesus and then the Father and have faith in Christ. Yeah? And that's, when the Spirit, uh, that's why the Spirit comes and dwells in and with believers. Just uh, to put it in kind of uh, Johannine terms, think about when Jesus says those hear my voice, the, my, my sheep hear my voice. It's the, it's the Spirit that allows those sheep and, the, and enables them to hear and respond to Jesus' voice, right? Whereas those who are not of his fold, those who are not his sheep, the world, they don't see and they don't know because their eyes have not been opened by the Spirit, their ears have not been opened by the Spirit. But this does raise an interesting question for us um, as you read verse 17. How can it be that Jesus says the Spirit is dwelling in them? He says you know him for it dwells with you. But then it's going to come later. You say, I'm sending the helper. How is it already there, but then he's going to send it later? How does that work? Um, Do they have the Holy Spirit yet? Do they not have it? Well, I think this gets into the whole question that we'll probably touch on a, a few more times in the next couple of weeks of, what is the difference between the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the New Testament? Because we confess and believe that it, whether you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, the work of the Holy Spirit in uh, regenerating someone, calling them to, uh, to faith, implanting that faith in them, uniting them to Christ, sanctifying them, that doesn't change. The Holy Spirit is necessary for faith in all eras of the, ch- of the church, of Revelation, Uh, believers in all times have to be enlivened and regenerated by the Spirit. But the difference lies in this, that in the Old Testament there were specific people, prophets, priests, and kings, that were anointed by the Holy Spirit, set apart, so the Spirit was with them in a particular way to enact God's purposes in the world. Think of Moses, as said, as having a portion of God's Spirit that he 
shares with his elders. Saul has the spirit rush upon him at various points. Elijah is particularly endowed with the spirit, and so is Elisha uh, after him. And those, all those kind of people point to Jesus, who is kind of perfectly and ultimately and completely anointed by the spirit. You think of Isaiah 61.1. Or you think of his baptism, where the spirit comes upon him. His ministry is a spirit-filled ministry, right? So when he ascends to the Father, and I'm I'm borrowing this from Sinclair Ferguson, uh, when he ascends to the Father, he's able to give us his spirit. It's the spirit of Christ, the same spirit that anointed him. His kind of spirit-anointed ministry, he gives that, uh, that helper. He gives that kind of anointing set apart, um, Holy Spirit anointing to the church, if you like. So that we have the Spirit of Christ. We are now prophets, priests, and kings. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, you know. So the Spirit is in us to enact God's will on earth, to continue Christ's works and rule in glorifying the Father. So that's what's to come uh, when he says, I'm sending you the helper. They already have the Spirit, but they're having this at the spirit of Christ, the anointed ministry that will have to kind of take Christ's name to the ends of the earth. Uh, and uh, we learn another thing about the Holy Spirit um, in verse 18, because Jesus says, I won't leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. I will come to you. Jesus says, I will come to you in this helper. So it, again, it's the spirit of Christ, uh, and it's the spirit of adoption. They're not going to be orphans. They're not going to be left alone. Because we could feel, if, we, uh, if we're honest, we could feel a little bit short-changed by the ascension. You know, If Jesus had just stayed on earth, that would make things really easy to have faith in him because he'd still be here. So we could think, okay, you know, yeah, the ascension, you're saying it's great, but wouldn't it just be better to have Jesus here? But he's saying, no, I am here by the power of my Holy Spirit. He's given us the spirit of adoption, um, which is why Paul says in Galatians 4, 6, famous verse, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's why we can pray our Father in the the Lord's Prayer, who art in heaven. We've been adopted as God's sons, right? The Holy Spirit is the, the agent of our adoption, if you like, the thing that unites us into the Trinity. Uh, And then as we go on, uh, keep going through what Jesus says, he says, yet a little while, verse 19, the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live it. You also will live. In in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So like I was just saying, uh, we get a glimpse of the kind of Trinitarian nature of our hope here. Um, There's a mutual indwelling the Father, we dwell in Christ, Christ dwells in us. Jesus is in the Father, we're in Jesus, Jesus is in us by his Spirit. You know, it's a mutual indwelling. So that when Jesus lives, we get to live because we're in him, right? When he rose from the dead, uh, he rose all that were with him, uh, all that were in him with him, and takes them up to the Father's bosom, if you like. That's why we can say that our life, our life is hidden with Christ in God, right? We've our united nature to Christ has been taken to the Father. We're in the bosom of the Father, the most intimate place. We're in sort of in the love of the Trinity. That's our hope. As we're united to Christ, we get to partake in the love of the Trinity. That's kind of the glorious good news of the gospel, really. And again, Jesus repeats uh, what he'd been saying by saying, whoever has my commands will keep them. That's who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by the Father, and I will love him and manifest myself into him. And we have this kind of discussion of what it means to manifest Jesus, for, to manifest himself to, the, to his, his sheep, his followers. Um, I think the important thing is that those who love Jesus will be loved by the Father. There's a kind of a mutuality of love as well. There's a mutual indwelling. There's a mutuality of love. But it's not that we first love God and then he comes and uh, dwells with us because John is also the person who wrote First John. Uh, first John says that, not that we didn't first love God, but he first loved us. Right? That's what makes it possible for us to see him and to know him and have him come and dwell in us. Right? And again, obedience uh, is the test of love here. 
So Judas kind of is, is the next disciple, not Iscariot. <laughs> Poor old Judas, uh, that name's being tainted, but uh, Judas, not Iscariot. He gets to be the disciple that uh, kind of um, engages with Jesus so that Jesus can explain what does he mean by manifesting himself. Um, and Jesus kind of reveals that this is a very intimate manifestation. It's not like uh, a manifestation that everyone gets to see because it's open, but it's inside us. It's a very intimate, personal manifestation, right? That uh, those who love Jesus, the Father and Jesus, will come and make their home in them, which is just a wonderful thing if you stop and contemplate that, because what is a, what is a home? Right? You could have, said, could have phrased it other ways. They come and dwell with him or come and be with you, you know, but come and make our home. A home is a place um, of dwelling. It's a place where someone's presence is, but it's somewhere where you belong, isn't it? Like when you say, make a house a home, like it's somewhere you belong, somewhere you want to be, it has a sense of kind of domesticity. You don't leave your home uh, unless you're absolutely forced to, right? There's an intimate intimacy between the believer and the father and the son, son coming and being in them as their home by the Holy Spirit. It's just a wonderful thing to contemplate this morning. And then uh, let's keep moving because we have got a, a, a lot to get through. I'm trying to be a little bit shorter this morning. Uh, this is the last uh, portion, I think, yeah, this is the last portion of the chapter from verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Okay, so we have, uh, sorry, which verse is it? We have, um, yeah, verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will, uh, the Father will send in Jesus' name. He'll teach all things, teach the disciples all things, and bring to remembrance all that Jesus has said to them, right? And this uh, is, a, is an important verse because later on in um, the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus is going to say that the Spirit, talking about the same Spirit, the Helper, the Paraclete, will lead the disciples into all truth, okay? And so that verse, which is uh, verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 13, and this verse have kind of been used by the church in all sorts of um, unhelpful ways, if you're a, a, a Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox, you would read this verse and you'd think, okay, we could, this, is, this is a good proof text to justify all sorts of traditions and doctrines that are not necessarily in the Bible because, hey, the, the Spirit's going to reveal things to us. It's going to lead, lead us into truth, right? It's going to teach us everything that Jesus said. So, you know, if you can't really find purgatory in the Bible, yeah, well, perhaps the Spirit revealed that to the church. If you're a liberal Protestant, you're going to use this verse to, um, as a proof text for the development and the progression of doctrine, where there's kind of new understandings on, uh, of what God's really doing. So you can say, okay, we've got this new idea about how humans can behave, um, a new ethical teaching. It doesn't really align with what's gone before, but that's okay because, you know what, the Holy Spirit teaches us everything that Jesus was uh, about. You know, the Holy Spirit reveals all truth to us, so we're good. Um, or if you're a Pentecostal, or even some sects like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and, and things, you can use this as a proof text that there's new revelations. You know, you're getting visions and you're having dreams, and it, these are, they're not in the Bible. Um, it's new revelation. Here's a proof text for you. Yeah, the Holy Spirit at work. He reveals truth. He's teaching us all the things that Jesus said. 
But obviously those three uh, interpretations are incorrect. This verse really helps um, and controls, if you like, the, uh, the other verse that I mentioned in chapter 16 that we'll get to in a few weeks. Um, because the role of the Holy Spirit is not just to lead the church into just kind of random elements of truth or bits of new truth. The uh, role of the Holy Spirit is to lead us into the truth or lead, rather lead the apostles into the truth of what Jesus had been doing and saying to them uh, already. It, he says in verse uh, 25 of our text this morning, uh, he'll teach all the things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And you, we've seen that already in John. You may think back to chapter 2 when he says about if you destroy my, uh, this temple and then I'll raise it again in three days. And then there's a little parenthesis where it says the disciples didn't know what he was talking about, but afterwards they realized, ah, oh, he's talking about his body. Uh, and again, uh, in the triumphal entry, same thing happens. No one understands it at the time, but afterwards, oh, this is what was happening. Jesus was riding in on a donkey that was fulfilling uh, prophecy from Zechari Zechariah. Or Zechariah, Zechariah. Um, and then again in the foot washing. They don't really understand what's going on with the foot washing, but later they do. After he's he died and uh, resurrected and ascended, they oh yeah, now I get it. So John, the way that John <laughs> intends us to understand this idea of the Spirit leading, um, leading the, the church into truth is that the Holy Spirit reminded the, apostle, the apostles of all the things that Jesus had been doing and the significance of them. They were there and they saw things and they were confused at the time, but after he died uh, and was resurrected, they got it. They had the kind of fullness of the gospel uh, and therefore they were able to write it down. So the Spirit has led them into that truth and then we have that truth in the Bible. That's the, the kind of the final revelation, right? So there's no, there's no extra traditions uh, to kind of be added by the Spirit at a later date. There's no new revelations to be added by the Spirit at a later date. And there's no kind of development, if you like, of doctrine in the kind of uh, more liberal Protestant understanding. Um, everything has to flow out of naturally and organically, if you like, from the, from the revelation that the apostles have in the Bible. That's why we confess ourselves to be an apostolic church and have the apostolic faith, because we stick to what the apostles said in the scriptures and don't add to them. There we go. And then uh, Jesus says another confusing thing a little bit later. He says, you heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I'm going to the Father, uh, for the Father is greater than I. And uh, this is obviously a proof text that people have used. Many people over the centuries have used this as a proof text to say, oh, the Son isn't equal to the Father, because he says he's, the Father is greater than I. How can he be greater if he's... Uh, equal. Well, you've got to read the verse in context because Jesus has literally just been saying, and he's been saying it quite forcefully several times, uh, if you've seen the Father, or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So obviously Jesus is saying there's an equality there, otherwise how could you see the Father? If, if Jesus was less than the Father, how would you have seen the Father by seeing Jesus, right? So when you get to this verse, he can't, he, it just logically can't mean uh, that uh, the Father is greater than the son in as much as there's a there's a some sort of a hierarchy or something or the father has something that the son doesn't so the way that we the church has traditionally read this is actually rather simple uh, jesus has a human nature right he's taken on human form the eternal son which is that is co-equal with his father uh, emptied himself by adding to him Self, a human nature and therefore was humiliated he went through a process of humiliation all the way to death um, and then will be exalted back to the father who in comparison to the humility of the human nature of Christ is greater right in the incarnation Christ had to humiliate himself and suffer and then he's going back to an exalted position where he won't suffer and he won't be humiliated now he's glorified I think that's, what's, that's what he's getting at uh, there. It's greater that Jesus goes back to the Father because then he's exalted uh, and he's no longer suffering the humiliation of uh, the incarnation and his death. And then finally, 
Perfect, yeah, perfect timing. Finally, uh, he says, the last couple of verses, I'll no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. So again, like we've talked about before, Jesus is in complete control, right? Satan has no claim on him. Him, Jesus knows exactly what's coming, and he's in control of it. But then he links back to the idea that we were talking about, that we are to keep Jesus' commandments, but those commandments ultimately come from the Father, don't they? Because Jesus says, like, all I've given to you comes from the Father. So you could say that these are Jesus' commandments. They're also the Father's commandments. And then Jesus explains to us, he's already done that. Like, we're to keep, if we love Jesus, we'll keep his commandments. Jesus, if he loves the Father, he'll keep the Father's commandments. And he says he's done it. He says, I do as the Father has commanded me. Right? So as Christ comes and dwells in us, we are to image Christ in his obedience to the Father. We're to become more like him by keeping those commands and bringing glory to the Father in Christ. Love and obedience, if you like, go hand in hand. As we obey, we're becoming more like Christ and we're glorifying the Father for those good commands uh, through our participation in uh, the life of the Trinity in the Son, united to the Son through the Spirit. So that's what's going on there. We'll leave it there uh, so that there's time for questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions or observations? There's a lot there. We, went over, we covered a lot of ground and we skipped over a lot of good stuff because <laughs> otherwise we'll never finish, John. Um, any questions? <laughs>